Let me draw your attention to verses 6, 7 and 8 in Isaiah chapter 44. Remember Isaiah the prophet around 800 BC is foretelling what Israel will, ex will experience when they are in captivity some two to three hundred years later. And the words that you have in this section of Isaiah are prophetic encouragement to them. And may I suggest then to everybody who reads it, for we are often in difficult places and need to know God's grace and favour, his attitude toward us. It struck me even as I read it that the subject is, do not fear, way back in verse 2, fear not, O Jacob. And then as you read on, verse 8, do not fear nor be afraid. Our tendency is to be afraid, isn't it? Especially when we're facing things that we don't know how they will work out or what will happen next. The solution to that fear is understanding and knowing God. And that's what you have in verses 6, 7, and 8. The first five verses encouraged us because they spoke of God's love and compassion toward his people. Here, the Lord will reveal himself as majestic and splendor and glorious in holiness. And therefore, that one being who can be trusted to bring us through every trial and tribulation until we finally settle in his presence. So verses 6 through 8, I've titled, The One and Only God. Now, even in saying that, I recognize it's controversial. We live in a day, don't we, when everybody's talking about a multitude of gods. Her Majesty speaks of a Christian faith. Her son, Prince Charles, has already says that when and if he becomes king, he will be the, the, the one who looks after the faiths. And so these are confusing times for us. Christians will always be challenged when, he's, when we say there is only one God. People will want to know how we come to that conclusion. Well, there are many reasons for that conclusion, but here's one of them. The Jews needed to be reminded that there is only one God. Because they lived in a world like yours, in which there were an abundance of so-called deities. The passage almost laughs at them, doesn't it? Because it describes getting a piece of wood, cutting it and using it to heat your body, using it to cook your food and then making it into a, a deity of some kind and worshipping before it. The God of the Bible is not man-made. The God of the Bible is, in fact, the creator of the heavens and earth. But I'm running ahead of myself just a little bit. You and I need to tell ourselves this. Because otherwise you'll be swept along with the tide of modern thinking. The Jews themselves were commanded to remind themselves of this every day. Back in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4 and following you get what is called the Shema. A prayer which every Jewish man and woman and child were to recite in the morning and in the evening of every day. This is what they were to recite. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. The Lord, our God, the Lord is one. And if they needed that kind of repetition in their lives, how much more do you and I today? They would perhaps have known of some of the nations on their borders. We have the advantage, disadvantage, of knowing everything that goes on in the world just as it happens. And that there are many who claim to be God. That passage in Deuteronomy goes on. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. If you remember, the Lord Jesus says that's the first and chief commandment. It goes on further. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart, not just your head. You shall teach them diligently to your children 
and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. It's to be something which is continually, consciously in your mind. The one and only God. Let me see if I can explain him a little bit from the passage. We'll consider this morning in verse 8 his worth. In verse 9, sorry, in verse 6, his worth. In verse 7, his words. And then verse 8, his witness. Bear with me then as I take you back to verse 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and the last, and I am the last. Beside me there is no God. That's pretty definite. That's quite conclusive. Conclusive. And in this passage, you get this message which has been presented at least twice already in the book of Isaiah. That everything else which men regard as God is an idol and is foolishness. If somebody made it, it certainly never made us. It's a man-made invention. In fact, if you follow the theory of evolution, they will tell you that, 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 that early on men and women created God. There were too many things they couldn't understand, so they created the, the idea that there must be some supreme being who regulates and creates all things. And you and I live in this world. And we believe what the Bible says. Because Jesus Christ, God the Son, became man, dwelt amongst us, taught us who God is, died for us, rose for us, reigns for us. Dear friends, let's be very clear. We are Bible people. And we believe, as it says here, that the Bible is the word of God. Thus says the Lord. Over and over. And if that's not true, it's time we threw the book away. Thus says the Lord. All scripture, Paul will say later, is God breathed. Now it's at this point you see that you find your security and your conflict. Because in our day and age, there are many who want us to reject the idea that God has given us the Bible. It's too big a subject for this morning. But it is possible, and I'm sure there'll be a good book on the shelf at the back, which will help you to consider this, a very important truth, that there is one supreme being, and that he is the God who chose Israel to be his people and who reveals himself to the world through Israel. His name, as it's given here, describes him. Notice how you get the different aspects. Thus says the Lord. In the original, you will have Yahweh or Jehovah, depending on your translation. <coughs> but where did Yahweh, I prefer that name, where did what Yahweh first appear? On the mountain, when Moses was looking for some lost sheep. And he revealed himself on the mountain to be the ever-living one. Who has always been and will always be. And so you have there immediately this challenge that there is one supreme being who is above and ab over all things. Because our experience is that everything in this world is on a downhill course. To returning to dust. Only God is permanent. He goes on, the king of Israel. It's quite clear when you study the earlier books of the Bible that when he delivered his people from Egypt, that he delivered them as their king. But of course, the sad news is by the time you get to Samuel after Judges, the people want a king like other, other nations. And that's where Saul and then David and the lineage comes from. But here is this 
as assertion that there has always been a king for Israel and that he is God himself. He's not only their king, he is their redeemer. That particularly points back to what we call Passover, when Israel were delivered from judgment and from Egypt. He's the one that has rescued them, paid the price, set them free. And he's also the Lord of hosts. The Lord of armies would be another way of translating it. And he's shown himself to be mighty on behalf of his people. Why, even in Isaiah's lifetime, Hezekiah, you remember, allowed the enemy to inspect the temple and its treasure. And then Sennacherib came, laid siege to the city, and it looked like the whole thing was going to fall around his ears. Until one morning, a couple of beggars went out and looked at the other army, and they found that the army had fled. God had acted on his people's behalf and set them free. So it is, as you read verse 6, you're taken on a whistle-stop tour of the history of the people of God at that point in the life of Isaiah. Something they needed to be encouraged with because they would be of special significance when Israel were in captivity feeling that all was lost and there was no way back. No, they need to know that there is still one sovereign Lord who is above all things, that all other gods are figments of man's fear and imagination. Again, that sounds like an arrogant statement, but it's not something that I'm saying or I think. It's what the Bible here says. To whom then will you liken God? Isaiah 40 and verse 18. Or what likeness will you compare to him? The same chapter, have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the, heaven, of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. This was the challenge to Israel, and it's the challenge to all of us continually in a world where we are more and more pressured to understand that all religions worship the same being. They don't. You only need to compare the brutality of Islam with the beauty of Christianity to see that there's something radically different between them. You go to the East and Confucius, well, he never claimed to be God. He only claimed to be a wise philosopher. Buddha, he, 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 he developed Hinduism, purified it, much like the Protestant Reformation did to the Roman Catholic Church. But at the end of the day, in, in Buddhism, there is no future hope of eternal life. The Buddhist looks for the day he will enter nirvana, which is nothingness, non-existence, freedom from what they call the cycle of karma and reincarnation. The Bible God is absolutely distinct, and that's what he wants you to understand. That's what Israel needed to understand. That's what we need to understand as we face the complexity of life and the mystery of what's going on. I've been halfway through verse 6. Go to the end of it. I am the first and the last. This is a new revelation to Israel. God has not been described like this before. He's making sure they understand that he was there at the beginning, and if there ever is going to be an end, he'll be there at the end. It's his way of saying what he says in other parts of the scripture, that he is the everlasting God. How long is everlasting? When we were children, we went by bus to school, paid our bus fare, but sometimes it was so packed, the conductor never collected the fare, and there was a sweet shop on the way to school. 
What did we buy? Everlasting toffee. Do you remember that stuff? It never did. I don't think it even got across the playground. We use words carelessly and need to understand, you see, that when God says he's everlasting, the first and the last, there is no accommodation included in that. He's the eternal Lord of time and space. Everything there, therefore, is under his control. And that's what you need to know when the, the world is turning your life upside down. Can you imagine what it's like to be a Ukrainian today? All their plans that they had last Christmas for what they would do this year. The nice houses, the lovely families. It's utter chaos. You need to know that there is something over, above and superior to all that has gone before. And that's what Israel needed when they were in captivity. Very soon, Ezra and Nehemiah would lead groups back to the promised land, but they didn't all go back. They need to know that there is a sovereign, absolute, majestic God. And it's interesting then that this phrase, the first and the last, is one which is found on the lips of Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Or again, and when I saw him, says John, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, now listen to this, do not be afraid. What's the cure for fear? It's there in Isaiah chapter 44. What's the cure for fear? It's knowing that there is someone who is greater and more powerful than everything else that is in our conscious existence. Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. Revelation is a much misused volume. I believe our mistake is we forget it was written to Christians in the first century. Around the time of Nero or perhaps Domitian, when the church was being brutally persecuted. And the book of Revelation then, with all its figures and symbols, has one single message. God's in control. And his plan will be the one which stands at the end of time. That's what you have in front of you. And that's where I want you to set your affections this morning. Let's be clear that there is one king, that there is one redeemer, that he is absolute God. And in the economy of God's revelation, his name is Jesus. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Oh, dear friends, that's comforted me this week. It can comfort you today. It's the reason we come to worship. If the gods that we are worshipping are just figments of our imagination or of somebody else's imagination, then it's a waste of time. In fact, that's why our churches are empty, is it not? We've been lied to for the last 140, 50 years. Since they came up with the idea that humankind invented itself. That it developed out of a puddle of mud with some lightning bolts. I am being a bit unfair. But since that philosophy has permeated our society. So that now modern man has no concept of a God to know, to worship, to bow before. You can understand why they have no time. And why our buildings are empty. What you and I need in our own life is a, a, a reaffirmation, an awareness, a Holy Spirit given awareness of who God is, what God has done, and what it means to live in his world. 
It will result in then a 24-7 commitment to live before him, living for him, listening to him, meeting with his people, singing his praises. Everything else is idolatry. One man wrote, today's idols are more in the self than on the shelf. I thought that was well put. We've been turned, haven't we? We're too clever to worship bits of stone and metal and wood. So now what's all, life is all about self. I must have, I will do. And we, the more we do it, the further we get from God himself. And then let me ask the unbelievers, those who watch online, those who worship with us, who are you worshipping? If you're not yet a Christian, you're worshipping a false god. One of your own imagination or yourself. You and I need to be aware, the Bible says, that no idolaters shall inherit the kingdom of God. Oh, you said, where's that? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. No idolaters shall inherit the kingdom of God. And for that reason, then, I need to exhort you to seek God and to find him. We've considered his worth. I want to consider now his words, because it is possible after you hear somebody saying that they are such and such, you would say, prove it. And that's where God's words come in. He proves himself to be God. And who can proclaim as I do? Then let him declare it and set it in order for me. Since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show these to me. In establishing himself as the only true God, he, he wants us to get our head round the fight that everything exi that exists came into existence because he spoke it into existence. Now, I know there's great controversy about understanding Genesis 1 through 11, but you kind of get away from this, this picture of God speaking, and it was so. There's no record of him having to get down on his hands and knees and <coughs> manufacture it. The picture in the Bible is of a God whose word alone brings things into existence out of nothing. The great mystery for the evolutionary thinker today is, has a fancy name called abiogenesis. Where did life come from? How do you get something out of nothing? Cleverest men on the planet have sought to wrestle with that. Stephen Hawking, wasn't it? He thought he found the answer, but when you look at his answer, what he's actually saying, it didn't come out of nothing. It came out of gravity. Where did the gravity come from? And the more you prod this, the more you see how... Uh, I was going to say foolishness. That's maybe unfair. They're very clever people the more you see that they, they're not thinking straight. Way back in the maybe third century, Augustine made the statement, nothing out of nothing comes. There has to be then someone to make it all. I used to have a leaflet which we handed out and it said quite succinctly, who made the big bang bang? And you have to answer that question. The Bible is quite clear. God made the big bang bang. And he did it simply by saying, let it be. It was in his mind. It was in his words. And here we are. Incredible. I hope you think it's incredible. It's not a cop out. We should study science. We should. In fact, when you look at the early scientists, what were they doing? They were believers, men like Einstein. They, they acknowledged God. Maybe there was a bit odd eccentricity about their religion, but they acknowledged God and they saw themselves as the people who were exploring what God had put in place. 
I don't know if you ever come across the recordings of Stephen Meyer. He's doing a tremendous job in modern times. The Discovery Institute. Have a listen. Read his books. And since there is this being who speaks things into existence and declares the end from the beginning and brings things to pass which were not previously there, those things which he brings into existence and says will happen are evidence of his almighty, incredible power. Who can proclaim as I do? Where else is there a being who can just manufacture out of nothing? As I said, he not only created, he declared what would happen. There's a passage in Jeremiah 29. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good work toward you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. That was given by the prophet of the J Jeremiah 150, 200 years after Isaiah. And, and he himself was one of the, the exiles, although he went to Egypt. Later, 70 years later, Daniel in captivity, chapter 9, verse 2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So that, so that the people were beginning to get restless. They were expecting to go back. Why? Because God had said it. God has been speaking down through history. The great proclamation of God is that one day his son would come. One day his son would come and suffer the, the, the punishment that the sins of his people deserve. That his son would be executed as a common criminal. We've read it in Isaiah. Run forward to chapter 53. God laid on him the iniquity of us all. You see, the God of the Bible not only creates, he saves, and he does that with such clarity and power. When men study the, the, work of the writings or the books of other so-called religious organizations, what they're studying is history. It's only really Christianity that has this forward look to a God of purpose, which says the son who came to die is coming to reign and will establish his righteousness. And so the challenge is here, and who can proclaim as I do? And then you almost get the picture of God standing back. Then let him declare it and set it in order for me. Let's hear it. Since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come. The God of the Bible is a God who is prophetic. He often spoke to men to bring that prophecy to our hands like Isaiah. But he is the one who brings all things into being and has a plan for history and will bring it to a good conclusion. In chapter 41, who has performed and done it? Calling the generations from the beginning. I, the Lord, am the first. And with the last, I am he. I have sworn by myself, chapter 45. The word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return that to me every knee shall bow. Does that sound familiar? Every tongue shall take an oath. The day is coming when everybody that's alive is going to acknowledge that God is God. 
Tragically, if they arrive at that day without first repenting and believing on Christ as their Savior, they will have no future in the presence of God. And therefore we call upon them to listen. So shall my word be, chapter 55, that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please. And it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. God's word will do the work that it's designed to do. And the fact that there is so much prophecy which has already been realized. I realize now I could have had a section in here on the birth of Christ. The place, the timing, the fact that kings would come and bow before him. All of it indicating to us that there is only one God and that there is solid proof in the word of God and in the people of God that that is so. Only the naive and ignorant follow other religions. Again, that might put the hairs up on the back of your neck, but it's true. There is only one way to God. I am the way. Who said that? I am the truth. No man comes to the Father but by me. Who would say such a thing? Oh, wait a minute. That was Jesus, wasn't it? And we thank him for that grace that's been given to us. But we live in a day when people are trusting blind experts. Again, I recommend to you Ray Comfort and his <coughs> wife, the master videos. He's a bit cheeky and pushes the limits a bit, but just listen to him. I listened this week to him interviewing. One of them is a, a professor at a university in California and the others were students. And he asked them just for one simple thing. Can you give me evidence of evolution? And immediately they would begin to say, yes, 60 million years ago. No, he says, can you give me evidence of evolution today? And every one of them had to admit they were stumped. The nearest you get, the nearest I've read, is some microbes have changed and developed. But then you stop and think a minute, what is evolution? It's not just a, a species developing within a species. It's one species turning into another species. That's what Darwin thought. That's what he wrote. And if you watch Ray Comfort, you'll see him bring these people to the same point where they have to admit that they're believing in evolution by blind faith. Blind faith. And if you're depending on the evolutionary scientists for your understanding of the world and life, you are living by blind faith. Christians don't. We have a book. We have historically verifiable evidence. We have a, a man who rose from the dead and, and was proven to be so. There's no blindness about that kind of faith, trusting him. What about the unbeliever then? They've been duped into believing in blind experts. I see the time I need to press on. He goes to a final point here. Do not fear nor be afraid. Have I not told you from that time and declared it? That's again a reference to the fact that what he said has actually come to pass. You are my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? I like this part. Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not I know not one. And that's God speaking. If anybody should know if there was other gods, he should surely. I know not one. Here he stakes everything on the existence of the nation of Israel. They are living proof that only Yahweh is God. You are my witnesses. I think I've misunderstood that in the past, especially from um, Acts chapter 1, isn't it? You shall be my witnesses. 
Because we think witnesses, that means I've got to talk. No, that's not what's here, although I commend to you talking about the gospel. The very existence of Israel was a testimony to God's purpose, pleasure, and power. And not just because they were delivered from external forces. They were so inclined to to blend into their world that they they were self-destructive. And yet the Lord brought them through. They are a living testimony to his deity, to his unique, inimitable deity. Their continued existence, not their perfect obedience, proves that God is God. And when you get that kind of understanding of God, what he's doing and how he works, then fear just goes out the window. They will want to come back in again, kick it out. Fear vanishes. How much time have you got? I could spend the rest of today just reading through and reflecting on the deliverance of Egypt, of Israel from Egypt, the settling of Israel in the promised land, the, the, the appointing of kings, and some of those kings were, were absolute monsters, weren't they? Hezekiah was a godly king, or as close to one as you got. But his son Manasseh, when the king was dead, reinstalled all the idols even in the temple. Israel's continued existence is a witness to who God is and what does. And there's a little allusion here. I just want to touch it before I finish. Is there a God beside me? Indeed, there is no other rock. God calls himself the rock. What is a rock? It's a, a place of refuge. It's a, 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 a somewhere safe and sound to stand on. You remember the Lord Jesus contrast building on the rock to building on the sand. And here we're told that God himself is Israel's rock. That didn't come out very well. Way back in Deuteronomy 32, Moses singing, ascribe greatness to our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are justice, a God of truth and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. What does it mean? To have a rock, it means that there is a solid ground to base everything on. Psalm 62, he only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength. And my refuge is in God. It became part of Jewish thinking. Because of what happened in the wilderness, you remember, they got to the point where there was no water and God commanded Moses to strike the rock and water came out of it. And then later on, there's another rock where instead of doing what God says, Moses lets off some steam and gets into trouble. But in Jewish thinking, not in biblical thinking, they they had this idea that that first rock actually followed them through the wilderness years. Because they realized that they needed someone solid to base their lives on. And the Apostle Paul picks up this idea. 1 Corinthians 10. All drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. That rock was Christ. That's sure and safe foundation. Therefore, says Jesus, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken them to a wise man who built his house, go on, on the rock. Our God not only is the only God. He he is not only the God who foretells what's going to happen. He is the God who has a people and who, who, who has delivered them and will deliver them. I'm of the persuasion that the church is the Israel of God. That's a big subject. But I believe that what's promised to Israel is still happening. And although we go through these periods of smallness, yet 
we shall not be fully crushed. And it might yet even please God to fill all these buildings again. I dream sometimes as I drive to Scarborough and you pass the converted chapels. I think, what are these folks going to do when revival comes and we need all those buildings back? Do you have that kind of vision? If you're reading this book and thinking these thoughts, then they should surely be up foremost in your mind. God is testifying to his own majesty and power. And those who trust him then are well able to face the ups and downs of life. There is a rock. Sinking sand won't hold you. The folks here know I worked in Saudi Arabia for a short time. There's an awful lot of sand there. And one day we took the family in our car to the beach. The Europeans had a beach to themselves. But you had a, a dodgy bit of desert to get in it. And the, the car sank into the sand up to the axles. The more you pressed the accelerator, the deeper it went. I had three young kids under 14 years old. 14, 12, 13, in that age group. My oldest son lying on the back seat of the car, gasping for breath. What are we going to do? We found some solid ground. It was the form of a shepherd's lean-to, which we took to pieces, dug the sand out the back of the car, and reversed the car onto the corrugated iron. From that minute, we knew what we were doing. We were going straight home. And we did, safely. Because we found solid ground. Christian brother or sister, can I just exalt you? Exhort you to make sure you're resting on him who is the solid ground. Because in him, you can face whatever comes knowing that when God is for you, it doesn't really matter who's against you. He's already given Jesus for you. How shall he not also freely with him? Romans chapter 8. Also give you all you'll ever need. My dear friends, there is only one God. And I'm glad to have come to know him by his grace. And to rest in him. A child asked his parents, and I'll close with it. Why is there but one God? Or a child was asked by his parents. Why is there but one God? Because God fills every place. And there's no room for another one. Make sure that God is your God. And go home singing today. Amen. Our final hymn is a confession for us. It is copyright, so if you're listening online, I need to disconnect you. But look at those words. It's a familiar tune. But the words are beautiful. My hope. Please notice the personal pronoun. You need to be able to say that to sing it. My hope is fixed on God alone, the God of sovereign grace. 130.
precious Father, we thank you for this wonderful, wonderful truth that you've revealed to us this morning, that you are God alone, the only wise God who inhabits eternity, and yet you are the same God who has sought the wandering sheep and drawn them into your fold. Thank you for that grace, O oh Lord, and help me to live today, tomorrow, and the rest of this week in the good and the power of knowing that God is for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let me remind you there's tea.